and yes. uh, I request everybody who is not speaking to kind of mute their microphones, please. Thank you. Thank you. I was just about to say that. Okay, great. So yes, let's make a start. Good day, uh, everybody. I know people are joining us from all sorts of different places uh, across Africa and around the world. So whether it's morning, afternoon or evening, good day and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, African Citizen Science Seminar. Uh, which we're very excited about. Um, you can see up uh, in front of you on my screen there just the, the basic outline of, of what we're going to cover today. Um, so after my first couple of minutes, uh, then we'll have some opening remarks from Professor Jamal Mimouni, he's the president of AFAS, the African Astronomical Society. Uh, and then I'll just do a very brief, uh, quick overview of citizen science, what it actually is. Um, and then we go to our main speakers, and we are very excited and honoured to have two wonderful speakers with us today. Uh, Dr. Patrick Miller from the International Astronomical Search Collaboration. Uh, so that's all to do with finding asteroids. And Dr. Beatriz Villaruel from VASCO, which is a very intriguing uh, title, Vanishing and Appearing Sources During a Century of Observations. There are two uh, main speakers and we're looking forward to hearing what they have to say about their projects. Um, then we'll have a couple of short uh, talks from people who are already uh, uh, have had some experience with these projects within Africa. Um, and I think, I hope we have with us Kaula from Algeria, from Sirius Astronomy Association, uh, and also Miracle, I'm not sure if he's joined us yet, but Miracle from Nigeria. Uh, so we'll find out uh, what, it, what, what kind of experiences have been, uh, uh, happened already. And then we have got quite a quite an amount of time at the end, plenty of time at the end for questions, any questions you have for the speakers, um, a general discussion. And really, we want to talk about uh, uh, how we go forward, because the whole point of this seminar is to get people excited, get you all excited about citizen science and to see uh, how you can actually take this forward and uh, start using citizen science with your, your groups or your friends or your clubs or your classes, whichever, whichever groups you're you're currently in. So that is what we are hoping to cover today. As I said, uh, or as Niruj said, please, if you could uh, keep yourselves on mute just uh, because of the, the background noise. Uh, and so I, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Jamal Mimouni, the president of ACE AFAS, if you could give us some opening remarks and let me just stop sharing my screen so we can see him. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Indeed, uh... Uh, we are happy to have this uh, all African and even outside the world uh, participating in the citizen science uh, seminar, the first of its kind. We wish it to kick to, to, to start at it because uh, we saw that the time was right. So what is citizen science? As you all know, I mean, at least in some aspect of it, it's having the public participate and collaborate in scientific research, contributing to uh, scientific progress. The who doesn't wish doesn't want to be citizen scientists. It is the best of both worlds. You don't need to have a PhD. You don't need to have done some higher studies, yet you are, you are participating, you are partaking in this, uh, in this science adventure. So that's, uh, as I say, you, are, you, are, you keep yourself as, it, as you are. You might be anything you, you can think of, uh, but, and at the same time, you participate in, this, uh, in, this, in these things. Uh, we do what scientists cannot do, that's also another interesting thing because they don't have time to it. They don't have time to monitor for long hours uh, stuff, what is going on in the sky. They don't have the patience to go through, to sift through um, to the data, a huge amount of data that they cannot analyze uh, or they analyze it in a specific way. I mean, through an, uh, I mean, the, uh, artificial intelligence, but they still need the human uh, uh, input. It's also, as you know, it is... Uh, no, so, so it is science, scientists and citizens working in symbiosis, okay? It is also, for the citizens part of it, it is, it is um, a skill enabler, a person who participates in that will learn many things that he, he might be using it or might, might need in other things. He is, uh, also, he might find some, uh, say, some, some vocation in the, into that. So two great progr uh, programs will be... Uh, presented to you, as uh, Sarah said. One is uh, discovering <laughs> this potential for discovering ast asteroids through the Astrometrica program and the ISEC 
will, as Patrick will tell us, is doing precisely that, who does not want to, uh, to discover a, a asteroid to be possibly named after him. And even if he doesn't want this glory, at least there is this aspect of participating in this, uh, uh, of hunting possible, uh, 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 I mean, asteroid killer. So we are participating in saving the earth in a sense. If you want to have to look at the altruistic aspect of it, you are, you are helping finding what, those, what are those dangers, future gender to earth. Uh, also from the, the second as, uh, project, the grid project indeed as Sarah has characterized it, it is appearing and disappearing object. There's many things in the universe, a lot of stuff, a lot of things, planets, uh, stars, but also galaxies, exploding objects, supernovae, kilonovae, whatnot, uh, fast radio bursts, gamma radio bursts, many things that we don't, we know, and other things we don't know. So the simplest things to, to characterize, to characterize things that we may not know uh, at all is to, is to see if they appear or disappear. The simplest thing, a person is die or alive, uh, a person is there or not there without knowing anything about its characteristic. So that's the point of trying to find out in a, uh, exactly that, possibly huge, uh, I mean, unknown things which just appear and disappear. And there's many aspects to it, of course, that uh, Beatrice will tell, tell us about it, even, uh, even possibly extraterrestrial, I mean, intervention. But anyway, that's the, 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 at the menu today. And I welcome you all again as the president of the AFAS, of this great initiative. We'll hear a lot of things, interesting thing today. But what is more important is that we follow up with uh, with form, with uh, with uh, with training and possibly have an African. Uh, I mean, have a sustainable groups in Africa in the citizen science. Thank you. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you. Um, let me briefly share my screen again. Although I have to say. Jamal, in your wonderful speech, you did say most of what I was going to say, but that's perfectly fine. <laughs> so yes, we're here to talk about citizen science. And just as Jamal said, it's basically uh, scientific research conducted by amateur scientists or public participation in scientific research. That's basically what it's all about. And uh, the great thing is, usually you don't need any prior knowledge or experience and usually no specialist equipment and again usually you can participate from your own location at your own pace. Uh, there, there are so many citizen science projects you know they do vary so that's why I've kind of said usually but this is the great thing it's very flexible and uh, you know really almost anybody can uh, can join in and it's not and again as Jamal said it's not just that you're given some kind of test data to look at it's real data from the scientists and you are actually contributing um, to the results. So uh, it's a great thing that we're really trying to uh, promote um, as well as helping out you know the scientists and, and conducting this research. Um, it's great for uh, kind of like a, a classroom project or you know kind of group work, teamwork, brainstorming. Um, you know you have to be pretty you know observant uh, you have to have some uh, dedication to really go through all, all the data and often you also learn some good um, digital skills so there's benefits on both sides everybody everybody benefits from, benefits from this so this is why we're we're uh, very hopeful that everyone will, uh, will will join in with this so that is my very brief little bit about citizen science so what we'd like to do is go straight on to our first speaker so Dr. Patrick Miller is with us to talk about the International uh, Asteroid Astronomical Search Collaboration. Just give me one moment. Now, uh, Dr. Miller is a professor at, of mathematics and he also teaches uh, introductory astronomy and astronomical research methods at Hardin Simmons University, that's in Texas, in uh, uh, the USA. And he founded the IASC in October 2006. Um, and he's also the vice president of the Permanent Council of the Global Hands-On Universe Association. Now, I, I, I'm sure at least some of you know about this. So this is another wonderful kind of hands-on project, uh, encouraging people to, uh, you know, get involved in, in hands-on teaching and uh, hands-on projects using astronomy data. So, uh, Dr. Miller, we are very pleased to have you here with us today. And if you would like to... Uh, start your presentation, but the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Sarah.
All right. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. All right, very good. Uh, I want to talk to you about, uh, about asteroid threats and the Isaac program. And as Sarah said, I'm, I'm Patrick Miller with the mathematics department at Hardin Simmons University in Abilene. So here we go. We'll first uh, uh, talk to you about, about exactly what threats that, that we're looking for, specifically things called near Earth objects or NEOs. And here's some photographs of a few NEOs uh, that are out currently out by, uh, 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 by the planet Mars. Phobos, in fact, is in orbit about Mars. It's one of its tiny moons, but it originated from the asteroid belt nearby. And it's a, a ball of rock, a chunk of rock about, about 25 kilometers in size. Eros is uh, that uh, one in the upper, uh, in the upper right. Um, it's about 30 kilometers long and five or 10 kilometers wide, shaped like a, uh, shaped like a peanut. It's also a Mars crossing asteroid. As a matter of fact, we've been there. We, uh, uh, spacecraft <coughs> visited uh, Eros uh, uh, in the early part of the, or beginning part of the, uh, of the current century. Uh, a couple of other asteroids out near Mars are Gaspra down in the lower, uh, lower left and Ida in, with its uh, companion Dactyl which orbits around is a binary, a binary asteroid. Uh, these are large chunks of rock, or large uh, boulders of rock that currently um, don't pose an impact risk with Earth. Uh, but over time, their orbits will change. And potentially, these large objects uh, in, on an order of millions of years will have orbits that change from uh, uh, crossing the orbit of Mars to moving towards the sun and perhaps crossing the orbit of Earth. When they do, uh, they pose a uh, uh, they pose a risk of impacting our planet. Eros, for example, we believe is uh, uh, is three times the size of the asteroid that uh, that, that hit the Earth uh, 65 million years ago off the coast of Mexico near Chicxulub, or present day Chicxulub, uh, resulting in uh, one of the one of the uh, factors that resulted in the demise of, of the dinosaurs. Looking out into the main belt, these are two of the larger asteroids. The one in the middle is the largest, that's Ceres, in comparison to the moon, just to give you a sense of uh, some, of the, some of the objects that, uh, that, uh, uh, th that exist out there uh, where we're looking. Uh, Vesta, smaller, and then Ceres, Ceres being the largest, about 900 kilometers in size compared to the moon. So these aren't very large objects currently. Uh, we've been to both Vesta and Ceres. The Dawn spacecraft went out to uh, uh, went out to Vesta, spent a year uh, researching, studying that that asteroid, and then they uh, moved it across the asteroid belt, and it spent another year at the uh, uh, out looking at Ceres. And here's a photograph of Ceres. As that spacecraft approached Ceres, they noticed uh, uh, two white spots. That you can see in the uh, in the photograph here on the bottom, and people were very excited about that. A lot of speculation on what those white spots were. Turns out that they were uh, 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 as, as the Dawn spacecraft arrived at Ceres and uh, investigated the entire surface. They found that not only did these two white spots exist, but there were probably dozens of them scattered around in and around the equator of uh, of, of, of that uh, of that asteroid and are likely salt deposits that originate from underground water, uh, water reservoirs. There's some speculation, perhaps there's even a subsurface ocean uh, at Ceres that, uh, that are producing these, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these, these salt deposits on the surface. Now, as far as the main belt is concerned and where uh, Isaac comes into play, here's a graphic uh, that I'd like to show. I talk about Isaac and asteroids. That uh, that was uh, each green dot that you see in this graphic is a known asteroid at, at, uh, in its position in the solar system at the time this graphic was made. And so you can see that uh, that most of these uh, these boulders of rock reside between the orbits of Mars, which is the, the orbit in red, and the orbit of Jupiter, 
the orbit in green. But if you look carefully, you can see uh, some of the uh, some of the asteroids are actually uh, not in that belt, uh, but uh, are near the Earth's orbit, which is marked in blue. And those are the objects that over time pose a serious risk impact risk with our planet. That's called the main belt or the main asteroid belt. Uh, the objects that have uh, been dislodged from the belt and a variety of processes that cause that to happen, Jupiter being a major culprit in causing that to happen, will uh, cause those orbits to change and move inwards. Some of them move inwards and uh, make contact with our, our orbital path around the sun and pose a, an impact risk. And we refer to those as the near Earth objects. There are thousands and thousands of those boulders that are wandering in the inner solar system, uh, potentially posing a risk to our planet. You also have some asteroids that um, are probably uh, origin different from the main belt, but uh, there's groups of asteroids uh, in the orbit of Jupiter, uh, ahead in Jupiter's orbit and behind in Jupiter's orbit that are, are probably leftover material from the formation of that planet. But most of this debris, that, uh, that, we, that we find uh, uh, in the program is located in orbits that are two to four times the size of Earth's orbit. Uh, that we call the size of the Earth's orbit an astronomical unit. So these have orbits two to four times bigger than our, our orbit. And they take uh, anywhere from six to eight years to orbit, to, to orbit once around the, uh, uh, to move once around the sun. So let me talk about uh, how uh, uh, Africa, is going to save the world by introducing to you a, pro a program called ISAAC. Now, ISAAC stands for the uh, uh, International Astronomical Search Collaboration, that's IASC. We call it ISAAC. Now, we know that IASC doesn't spell ISAAC, but that's what we call it. Uh, as Sarah pointed out, this was formed in October 2006 here in Texas at uh, in Hardin Simmons University. Uh, what it is, uh, it's an online educational outreach program in astronomy. It's targeted for high schools, colleges, amateur astronomy groups, uh, citizen scientists around, around the world. And currently there are uh, 6,000 schools uh, and teams from 80 countries that participate um, each year in the program. That represents about uh, 40 to 40,000 to 45,000 uh, citizen scientists, students and citizen scientists uh, looking for asteroids in the program each year. We provide images that were taken recently at a professional observatory. We work with two observatories, and I'll show you a bit, little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, but using these images, the students then uh, uh, and citizen scientists can make original discoveries, detections, and ultimately discoveries of, of asteroids. Uh, these detections then are officially reported on behalf of the students by Isaac to the Minor Planet Center at Harvard. The Minor Planet Center at Harvard is the world's repository uh, of, uh, of, of data on asteroids and other small bodies in the, in the solar system. It is uh, recognized by the International Astronomical Union as, as having that, that official function. Here, just some basic information over the years since the program started in 2006, showing you the growth. Uh, the, top, the top chart shows you the growth starting in 2015-16, when we had 300 groups, schools, to the recent, the current academic year, the current year, 2021-22, where it's grown to over 6,000. And then the number of participants in that second, in that third column over, it's all, it started off with around 2,000 uh, six or seven years ago. It's now over 40,000. And the number of countries involved, currently that's around 80. And this, in the graphic, the bar chart that you see below there shows you the, uh, the breakdown uh, by ethnicity. Although the Indian there, that is not, uh, that's not Native American Indian, that's actually the country of India. I'm not sure why my staff broke it out that way, but uh, we have, actually we have more uh, uh, students and citizen scientists participating from India than we do any other, any other country in the world. It's, it's very simple how it works, <clears throat> but let me, let me show you. Uh, one of the observatories we work with is PanSTARS, using their, they've got two telescopes, 1.8 meter telescopes, located in Haleakala at the University of Hawaii. And here's a photograph of PanSTARS-1 as it was being constructed. 
we download uh, our uh, from their uh, uh, from their uh, archives at uh, in Hawaii um, a set of images that come in packets of four. They're called quads. I'll tell you more about the really massive size images that we that we use. Uh, we part we partition those into into smaller fields and then the, distribute them out to the uh, uh, through uh, the cloud-based pipeline uh, to uh, to our schools and participating teams of citizen scientists. Uh, they come to Hardin Simmons University uh, online, uh, where they come into our uh, our 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 uh, website and they download their images. And each school gets its own set of images. We don't we don't duplicate. And then the students, citizen scientists, using a program called Astrometrica, look through these images. And Astrometrica is, is designed to, uh, to help them find uh, and measure uh, uh, moving objects using a blink procedure. If uh, they make a detection uh, that's not uh, reported by the, by the larger sky surveys, uh, uh, we, there, we have another network that does follow up on the more interesting detections, uh, one being the uh, uh, Las Cumbres Observatory two meter fox. And we'll repeat the process and prepare a second report then that is uh, sent in to, uh, as a confirmation to the first report originally made by the participating citizen scientists. So that is a, a flow diagram, shows you a how the program how the program works from the observatory uh, to the student, uh, back to the observatory, and finally to the Minor Planet Center. This is the main uh, uh, facility that, uh, that we work with. It's the PANSTARS. PANSTARS stands for Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System. Uh, the photograph you see in the upper left is a 1.8 meter PANSTARS-1 telescope. And as I mentioned, that is uh, on Haleakala in Maui, one of the Hawaiian Islands. And it's managed by the Institute for Astronomy at the, uh, at the University of Hawaii. It's not the world's largest telescope by any, any means, but it does currently have uh, one of the world's, if not the world's largest digital scientific cameras that takes large image, or, or from our astronomical perspective, large stretches of sky three degrees across. And each image then contains uh, about 1.4 billion pixels, an amazing amount of, of information uh, contained in those images. Now, during a campaign, uh, and we've got monthly campaigns that we run coincident with the lunar cycle, starting from third quarter moon to, th to third quarter moon. Uh, during one of the monthly campaigns, we'll get 65 to 75 of these images from PANSTARS. And then we'll take those, each of those images, package of images that come in packets of four quads. And we we'll partition those into about 200 some images and then distribute these out to 300 to 500 schools and citizen science teams. And it's not unusual that from just one image, students will be able to observe more than 150 of the main belt, uh, main belt asteroids. The second facility we work with is the Catalina Sky Survey. So that's located uh, at the University of Arizona, managed by the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. It's a, a little bit smaller telescope. Uh, and, and the fields are also uh, sm uh, smaller than the, uh, the images we get are smaller than what we get from, from PANSTARS. And just here's some information about those. And we also make, can, uh, make that data available to the participating students in the Catalina Sky Survey. Over the years, and it's been many, many years, as I say, this started in 2006. So we're coming up to, uh, uh, to our, well, our 15th year this year, moving on to 16 years since we started. Uh, and these are some of the students over the years who've uh, made uh, discoveries, who have, uh, uh, who made their original detections. The, the detections have gone through the discovery process out on the other end and are now numbered. And this is a girl in, uh, uh, high school student at the time in uh, here in the United States in Massachusetts, posing with Astrometrica. She made she made a detection that resulted in a number of discovery. 
these are uh, college students uh, near here in Texas, uh, located in the Dallas area, and they made three uh, uh, three discoveries. Uh, this is in Brazil. Uh, this is uh, uh, Gustavo Haas uh, in um, in the southern part of Brazil at one of the federal universities. He and his college university students uh, have participated in Isaac, and they made a number of observations and detections and resulting in discoveries. Uh, these are students, I think they're in Portugal or, Roma or, or Bulgaria. I we're reading that. I think, I think they're in Bulgaria. Bulgaria, it's written. Yeah, Canada. Bulgaria. Uh, we have about 40, 40 different uh, teams of citizen scientists that participate in Bulgaria. This particular group is uh, affiliated with the, their national observatory in, in Rosen, Bulgaria. Uh, this, is, uh, this is China. Uh, we have about uh, 20 or 30 teams in the Beijing area that actively participate in China, and a few teams in and around, the, uh, in around that country. This is Hong Feng Gao, who's uh, posing because she's pointing at a big bright star that's not an asteroid. Uh, she's posing with some students from Beijing High School. And they participated, uh, the, uh, this is through the National Observatory and China Hands-On Universe. And they've been participating in Isaac for, uh, for almost since, since we began the program in 2006. Uh, this is Portugal. I think these are middle school students in Portugal. We have, in Portugal, we have uh, about 65 participating uh, schools and teams of citizen scientists from Portugal and former Portuguese colonies that participate. Uh, this is Japan. These are university students at Shizuka University in Japan. And here's another picture of a group of those students. All the students in that room are looking for asteroids using the program Astrometrica. Uh, these are high school students in uh, near Washington, DC. Some more high school students also in the Washington, DC area. Uh, these are some students from Mozambique, former Portuguese colony, searching for asteroids. India, as I mentioned to you earlier, we have about 1,200 schools of the 6,000 in, in Isaac that participate. Uh, 1,200 of them come from, uh, from India. And these are three students from India who are looking for asteroids as part, as part of that program. In Poland, as a matter of fact, Poland was the very first country outside the United States to participate in Isaac. And here's a, a photograph taken uh, where an award was being given to some high school students who made, uh, who made some uh, asteroid detections and discoveries, ultimately became discoveries. We have a, a program that we're just now developing where we invite uh, the, the, uh, the experienced uh, uh, measurers or observers of asteroids who participated in Isaac campaigns to, uh, to become regional collaborators and trainers. And so these are some of the trainers we have. The top three come from Brazil. Those are high school students in Brazil who uh, have been active in Isaac for, many, many, for a long time. And now what they do is working with the, with the program we have with the federal government of that country, uh, uh, they train teachers all around, all around in all 26 states of Brazil and also the, the, the federal district in Brasilia. Uh, Panama, this is Alberto, who's uh, uh, been a long time, he's a university professor. He does training uh, in Latin America or uh, in that part, that, part of the, uh, that part of the world from Panama. Sri Lanka, and then I've got two, uh, two students there who do the same thing from Bangladesh. Uh, this is, um, these are some students, these are Brazilian students, Christian Martins and Bruna Pontes, uh, who we gave special awards in Isaac for some of their observations. And we also have gone out and uh, proposed to the International Astronomical Union names of asteroids in their honor. Christian Martins uh, was named after the uh, asteroid, numbered asteroid 2007 KE7, and Bruna Pontes after the numbered asteroid discovered in 2013. And on the right is uh, interesting, 
uh, young lady. She's, uh, I think she's eight years old now. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, international publicity about her being one of the youngest astronomers, but she's been participating in Isaac now for two years and uh, has made, I think, uh, uh, about 10 or 15 preliminary uh, detections of asteroids. Nicolina. Uh, this, these are students near Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, showing off her certificates and participation. Um. Patrick, uh, yes. I, I hate to interrupt, but if you could be rounding up, I know we're all enjoying your presentation. I've got two, I, got, I think I got one more slide after this and then, and then I'm done. Oh, that's great, thank you. Uh, uh, students in Sao Tome, Principe, Science Lab, I think these are seventh grade students. And this is the last one. This, these are students in Morocco. Uh, um, there's a, a Zaridi. This is Zaridi from, uh, and his students from a small rural area in Morocco have long been participating in the Isaac programs. And uh, there they're having a, uh, a party to celebrate their, uh, uh, their participation in the program. All right, well, that is, uh, that is what I have to share with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Later to answer, answer questions. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's a really great um, uh, comprehensive overview of, of the asteroid search campaign, what it involves and how, how it spread. That's amazing to see those statistics of how it spread to all the different countries, so many different countries and how the numbers of participants have grown. That's really, that's really great to see. And of course, we're hoping to help you grow that even more. <laughs> Um, so what we'd like to do, I'm sure, I'm sure people have questions, but I think what we'd actually like to do is keep the questions to the end. So if we could actually now shift our brains now into uh, vanishing and appearing sources, and we'd like to invite uh, Beatrice to uh, come and uh, take over. So let me just do a quick little introduction. Yes. So, so Beatrice is the, uh, the principal investigator of the VASCO project. As I said, it stands for the Vanishing and Appearing Sources During a Century of Observations. Uh, she has a PhD from Uppsala University for researching on active galactic nuclei. Uh, and then she did her first postdoc at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And since 2018, she's been a postdoctoral researcher at Nordita in Stockholm in Sweden and at the IAC in, in Tenerife in Spain. And I also saw that uh, uh, Beatrice received the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science Prize. So that's excellent for her work in VASCO and the search, the search for these uh, strange vanishing stars and other objects. So Beatrice, we're very happy that you've joined us today uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I will tell you then about the Vasco project. And so how did it all start? I'm sure you all wonder. First, I want to show um, the people who are in the Vasco project. It's a, we are a very big team, a very diverse team. And the um, your, your video is off. Ah, okay. Sorry. I will turn it on. How does one do that? Um, so let me stop sharing. Lower left, so, maybe. Now, yeah, there you go. Yes, I forgot to turn it on. <laughs> Sorry. So, I uh... so this is our team, and now I will start telling you about what uh, how Vasco started. It boils all down to one of the most fundamental questions I think many of us are interested in, and that is: Are we alone in the universe, or is there any other civilization out there? And that is kind of the, yeah, that's how Vasco started. And um, it comes in the background of why should one look for ET? I think we know that there's a lot, a lot of stars in the Milky Way. We like two or 300 billion of stars just in our own galaxy. We know that there are about 400 billions of galaxies just in the observable universe. And you, if you calculate the number of um, Earth-like planets that you have around sun-like stars, you get a huge number. So um, there are good reasons to look for ET. 
Traditionally, this has been done in the, in the radio since the 1960s. And as we know, there are so far no, uh, um, no reported candidates and that has survived um, as, well, no set of candidates that has emerged from these radio searches so far. And if it would have worked, it would have been the best way because you have something that is really gives you a clear signal of communication that you can't confuse with anything else. It's a very accurate way. However, it's also pretty costly and you need to do a lot of observations. However, there's another way to look at these searches for ET. Maybe one doesn't need to look for something that is uh, only ET, but one can look for anomalies because very often when we search for some type of, um, or very often when we have found an anomaly, we do some kind of new discovery. For example, when, um, when the quasars were discovered in 1963, and the discoverers saw something that looked like a star, and like, and this star had a very peculiar spectrum that showed that it was like uh, that was redshifted, and the discoverers started saying, "Okay, what is this? I see a star, but it kind of has this sort of redshifted spectrum. What is, what am I actually seeing?" And that's how the quasars were, for example, discovered. Uh, also, the pulsars when um, one discovered it first, I mean, it was seen like some type of anomaly. One even thought that maybe these are some type of uh, little green men, aliens. And uh, well, we know nowadays that pulsars are no aliens, but and um, just the idea of that maybe it is aliens actually made people to really investigate these uh, curious objects at first and progress the science faster. Maybe some of you have also heard about Tabby Star, which is a star that showed a very uh, peculiar dimming in the last few years. Um, it was quite a lot of it was visible a lot in the media because people were wondering could this be kind of uh, maybe some type of aliens that have built a mega structure around Tabby Star? Uh, could that be the cause of this very weird dimming? So there were lots of news items all the time in 2016. Uh, where they were discussing if Tabby Star could be uh, aliens or not. So far, there has been nothing that supports that there are any type of aliens because they have looked for lasers and from radio signals from Tabby Star and nothing has emerged from there either. But still, it's a very interesting uh, anomalous object that people can test their physical theories on. In the last year, however, I think the, the object that takes most prizes when it comes to visibility in media is the Oumuamua. I forgot to put an apostrophe at the beginning of Oumuamua. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about this uh, very weird shaped asteroid that um, some people think, uh, or a small group of people think might be a space rocket. And again, one wonders, is it aliens or, or is it something else? And here we can see how this kind of this, this discovery of anomalies actually leads to the follow up question, is it aliens? And I'm going to bet that more often or that more often than not, you're going to actually do a uh, big progress once you understand these weird objects and they don't necessarily have to be aliens. But the question is important, maybe from an inspirational point of view. So what is Vasco? Well, the Vasco is about uh, comparing the sky as it looked uh, 70 years ago to the sky as it looked today and see if you can find something really anomalous. For example, a star that has vanished. And this is also where we focus uh, our efforts. We are trying to look for vanishing objects. So we have these catalogs from the 1950s. These catalogs were taken before you have any satellites in the sky and you compare them to the catalogs of today. So what we truly would like to, to find would be a vanishing star that, well, a star that has vanished through stellar engineering, where you will see several images in the, in the past of the star. And then you look at uh, the same spot today in the pan stars and you find nothing. And if maybe you even point a big telescope there and you really kind of uh, observe very deeply and you still find nothing. That is our holy grail. That is what we wish to find. However, you're also going to find a lot of other things. In many cases, you're going to find like a single image uh, with a transient, which could be um, that you catch a erupting star or a gamma ray burst uh, optical afterglow in, this, in its brightest state. 
You can also catch other things like naturally very extremely variable objects. You can find uh, maybe some type of uh, long-term variable uh, active galactic nuclear quasar. And there is also uh, one more type of objects that we kind of would be interested to find, and that's so-called failed supernova. I will come back to them. Well, so this is the big hope, and this is all the things that we collect in the project and we publish in the or plan to publish in the tables. Simply everything we can find, and then we have to do this categorization. So I mentioned, uh, for, for example, this failed supernova possibility. Well, there are some uh, th uh, theories that for a particular range of, um, of masses of stars, let's say it's 18 to 25 solar mass stars, you can have a, a situation where the star kind of when it dies, that uh, or when it undergoes a core collapse, it doesn't undergo a bright supernova, but it actually directly collapses into a black hole. So you first you see a star and then you see nothing. Now there are no really good candidates. There are some claimed candidates, but they are not very good. Here you see one of uh, one example of uh, a candidate, maybe one of the best so far. You see an image in 2007 of a star in a in an other galaxy than our own. So these are Hubble images. So you see it there. You don't see it eight years later. I haven't seen the images since. Maybe it has reappeared. So maybe it didn't vanish. Maybe it's just a variable star. Anyway, uh, if, if you have 70 years of data and you combine different catalogs that you can find during this time period, you can actually get a much longer um, light curve or more points for your light curve. Another scientific opportunity I, measured, uh, I mentioned are long-term variable quasars, which could really test um, the theories we have on, uh, on the accretion of quasars. This is something I'm also very interested in. Um, I will, I will not. Sorry? Oh, no, I mean, in every society, there will definitely be the first. There will definitely be the difficult ones who would not listen to anybody and they will still do what they would want to do anyway. They are uh, by birth, they are bullies. Well, well, it's what they are, it's who they are. So, how should the rest of us deal with such people? You know what? I would say that. Sorry, please. If I think someone just left the, uh, the unmuted, please. Oh, if everyone okay. can mute. Sorry, I, I muted them. Oh, you have muted. Thank you, Nuraj. I was looking to see if I could do it, but I didn't seem to be able to. Okay, sorry. No, please continue. Sorry, I thought we lost the question. No, no, no. Yes. No. Um, so um, now I, I presented the background of the Vasco. So now in 2020, we presented the first uh, Vasco paper. Um, where we had 150,000 of candidates that we know are most going to be false positives. And of these, um, we, vi we visually examined 15% ourselves, like one by one, in searches for these so-called vanishing stars. And here's an example of the type of objects that one finds. You can see something in the 1950s. This is some image from 1950s in the red. You see something there, you don't see it in the 80s. You don't see it in 2019, 2015. Here's another example. You see something in the 50s. You still see it in the 80s and actually see it in one more band from the 80s and you don't see it after. And so we have we got like 100 transients that looked like stars, the typical stars that you had there. And we knew that they either had to be like very red because most of them were found on the red plates or they are very short lived. We could exclude a number of natural phenomena and we ended up with uh, some of our favorites, which is like that they should be, that they maybe were erupting M dwarfs or that they could have been afterglows to gamma ray bursts or fast radio bursts. So what do we do with 150,000 candidates? Well, um, we, we have on a team uh, at Uppsala University led by Christian Pelkmans that constructed a citizen science webpage and the idea has then been that one combines an AI together with um, and that together with uh, citizen science in order to study these 150,000 of candidates. I will not tell you too much about the AI now, but it's it's supposed to um, bring up, bring up the most interesting candidates. We we have we don't have it activated yet. It's still under learning, as far as I understand. It's uh, learning, and we will see how it will be developed. 
So this is the web page that some of you might be very familiar with. Once one enters, you come to a splash screen. And then what the user can do is to simply go there and compare images, the image from 1950s with the image from pan stars like 70 years later. And the goal is to, to look in the center and see if something has vanished. And then there's a lot of things that you can do with this web page. We will hear more about it later, I think. And uh, this citizen science effort we are doing with the groups. Um, and we, uh, for example, the Sirius Astronomy Association, and we will hear Kaula uh, talk more about it later. And we also work with Emek Adom in Nigeria, who is also going to tell us more about it later. So after my talk. So I saved it, this bit um, for, the, for the other speakers. So we have been working on this as a citizen science project uh, all together. And um, as on the 20th of October, we already reached more than 221 thousands of classifications. Um, many of these also came with that there was a video that appeared on YouTube um, that was very spread, but where in this video that was made by an influencer, uh, he was showing how the citizen science project uh, of ASCO works. So we got a quite a big explosion of data in the last few months, and now we need to analyze it all. And we're, from this, we're having a, almost 4,000 of candidates, uh, vanished star candidates that we have to really inspect, but also 2,400 other objects that can be very interesting. So this is the stuff we have worked on so far. However, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, a paper also and a project that we are working on right now, uh, some new problems that are like new scientific questions that emerged in the last months. And this relates to a very funny um, candidate that we had in the paper from 2020 before the citizen science start, uh, project started. Uh, so one of these hundred transients that we found in our first ASCO paper turned out to be really weird. Let me explain you why. So what happened here? There. <laughs> I think I... So here you can see in the green circles, don't watch the purple circles. The purple circles are, are artifacts that we found. But in the green circles, you can see nine stars that are beautifully present in an image from the 1950s. You look at the same field in the 80s and you find that these nine, nine stars aren't there anymore. It gets more fun. One can compare it to, um, to images like taken half an hour earlier or images taken six days later, and you don't see them again. So they are only present in this particular image. Something is happening here with my computer. It's not jumping. Yeah, not, now it's, it's something is happening with the program. I don't know why it's not moving forward. Let me try to log out. I think my computer got hung up. Um, did I lose the connection to the Zoom also? No, you're still with us. We can hear you and we can, can see your screen, but... Yes, I would need to stop the screen sharing or something because it got, it got blocked. Or I will try to use the... Let's see if I can move forward. We, we see, anyway, we see the next slide, Beatrice. We see the next okay. slide. Yeah, now it's yeah, the one with Stefan. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> anyway, so I showed you nine stars that were there and that vanish and they appear and vanish within half an hour and you never see them again. So we, um, together with Stefan Geyer at the um, GTC in Canary Islands, we did deep follow-up observations of uh, some of these nine stars, not all of them. And you can see these beautiful stars. And uh, we hope to find some type of counterparts. Well, we found something, but we can't say that they are real counterparts. It could just be that yeah, we did so deep imaging that we always will find something there. So we couldn't tie them in any way. And the problem with these nine stars is really that there are far too many in a small part of the image in order to be explained by any known astrophysical phenomena. So we were going through one, um, one type of scenario by one type of scenario and excluded every single astrophysical explanation. 
Then we started looking into the instrumental explanations and we were looking into things like, um, well, first thinking maybe it could be some kind of ghost image, maybe it could be some type of um, double exposure. We have been going through lots of different things and we couldn't find any reason either why we would have suddenly nine beautiful stars in the image, in one particular image. Finally, we proposed that maybe it could be some type of unknown contamination. For example, let's say you have some type of nuclear fallout from atomic bombs, although we cannot prove it and there are the problem that um, there were no uh, officially listed nuclear bomb, uh, bombs experiments in the United States um, where the observation happened in the same year as we have the image. Anyway, unknown contamination seems to be an uh, explanation that can always fill in anything when we don't know what is the reason. However, we also started playing with uh, an alternative explanation. Let's say that these are actually real observations. And one of the things that actually could cause these kind of things, if you would have the same instrumentation today and the same telescopes and watch the sky, you would find many of these multiple transients. But this wouldn't be caused by anything natural. They would be caused by that you have lots of debris and satellites in geosynchronous orbits. And when you have that, you very often can get a very short glint when um, like lasting maybe up to half a second. And sometimes you might only see one glint, sometimes you might see two glints, and sometimes you might see many glints. It depends on how fast the object is spinning. And uh, so, of course, one can kind of start to, start to play a little bit with the idea of what if the stuff we see is actually real and could be some kind of similar glints from, let's call it, highly reflective and flat pieces of, at geosynchronous orbits. And of course, if that would happen in the 1950s, it would be a very, very small rate of them. For example, today you have 1,800 glints per hour per sky, visible just with a naked eye from the Canary Islands, while here we are having some rates that are something like 0 0.07 uh, down to a magnitude of 20. So that it would be very, very few and very easy to miss if that would be the case. And that made us write uh, a new paper that's now under re review, where we are making a case for using the, this old photographic plate surveys from 1950s uh, in order to search for, let's call it alien space probes. Because if we are capable of sending something to another uh, stellar system, which we might well be in within 50 years, maybe also another civilization might send something to our solar system and uh, we might be able to catch one of these probes. There are many good reasons to use these photographic plates over the modern CCD surveys and the most important is that we are dealing with the pristine skies. There were no satellites before 1957 that could dist disturb us. Moreover, these objects, if someone would place a probe um, in orbit around Earth, it can be there for millions of years. So um, in this paper, we discussed that first one could you, like look for streaks that are weird, maybe, but more importantly, um, we, we are interested in these kind of signatures of reflective objects in photographic plates. And these you can actually find in the citizen science project. One of the signatures would be, let's say, multiple transients, as we talked about earlier. However, the problem with these multiple transients is that you can confuse it with some type of unknown contamination that we cannot pinpoint yet. Maybe there's something that would give such false stars that we just don't know yet. Another thing is that uh, if you have a rotating dish, you can sometimes produce triple transients. Here is uh, an image that I don't know if it's real. Maybe it's again the same problem with the contamination. Uh, it's an image from the 1950s, but as I mentioned, the, the other boring possibility um, could be disturbing uh, in order to make any kind of conclusions. We can still be dealing with false uh, positives in the images. So what would actually be uh, much safer? What would be a safe signature? Well, it turns out that if, if you have transients that fall perfectly along a line, 
you can actually say that, yes, this is no contamination because contamination has no reason to align on a line. However, if you would have something in geosynchronous orbits, they would fall uh, on a line. And we did some calculations and we estimated that if you have at least four, as uh, yeah, now I, I just wrote more than four, it should be written uh, at least four, sorry for that. Um, but if you have at least four objects, you know, this kind of simultaneous transients that fall uh, along a line, you have a good signature of uh, something that is highly reflective, a flat in a geosynchronous orbit. For example, if you find this. So when people will be uh, doing these citizen science projects, I hope that one can also search for these uh, interesting signatures because that would be very, very helpful. In this example, you have something that is um, very fast spinning, while in reality, you might just have a few glints. So summing up, uh, we have started by looking for vanishing stars and unusual transients, and we're using, we're interested both in the conventional astrophysics, like I talked about the quasars, the failed supernova, and we are interested in the exotic questions um, related to SETI. And now in the last months, we also are extending our interest to multiple transients because of the possible uh, SETI explanation if one would find something that really would support that they are real phenomena that we see. And in this way, I think that the citizen science project has a very good potential to uncover many new anomalies um, that maybe the modern transient surveys might have missed. And this is something that we can all do together. And with that, I think for myself. Thank you very much, Beatrice. That was really fascinating. Uh, I love the fact there's so many, so many possibilities. I mean, all these different possibilities, and that, and you have to be so uh, that painstaking way you have to go through and and decide is it this, is it something else. Very, very interesting. So thank you very much for that. Um, now again. Uh, uh, I know I'm sure people have, have questions, but what I'd like to do now is turn over uh, to some uh, some other speakers who are going to talk about their experiences of these two uh, projects uh, within Africa, different places in Africa. So since we've just uh, finished with Beatrice, I, I believe we have both Kaula here and Emeka, who, uh, as Beatrice mentioned, have been working on this. And I think I did see them online. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to speak first. Uh, maybe Kaula, do you want to speak about? Yes, uh, of course. We, well, welcome, Kaula. Welcome, Kaula. Uh, so we'd like to hear now about uh, your experiences of the, the Vasco project uh, with uh, Sirius Astronomy Association. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there's another voice I'm not hearing well. Uh, yeah, uh, please go ahead. Now it's fine. Um, I was saying good afternoon, everyone. I'm really um, glad to be with you today at this uh, Open African event uh, organized by AFES uh, Outreach Committee. Um, let me please briefly <laughs> introduce myself. Uh, I'm Khawla Lagoon. Uh, I'm a medical student and a member at uh, the Series Astronomy Association based in Algeria. And uh, I'm the coordinator of the Vasco Citizen Science Project in Algeria. Uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor um, Jaman Mimoni, who uh, introduced me and the team to this promising project and has put us on the road since 2020, uh, with the help, of course, of a team of young uh, framers, uh, including um, some of them are um, present, I uh, believe, uh, today with us, uh, some uh, others uh, like Zaina Baisani, Shaima, uh, Mohammed Qureshi, and with the guidance of um, Hisham Gurguri, who is involved in both the research team and the citizen science project part of the Vasco project. Um, it is good to mention also that I'm a teacher in um, Astrometrica, one of the uh, groups here in Algeria with Sirius and with the Basar uh, Science uh, Club. Uh, without any further uh, delay, let's dive in. Um, as you see, like um, I would present Vasco in uh, 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 in Sirius Astronomy Association in Algeria, and um, maybe um, give me some seconds. Uh, do you see the full screen? 
Uh, yes, yes. Okay, that's yeah. great. Uh, so briefly, I just don't want really to uh, talk a lot about uh, Sirius, but th this is Sirius Astronomy Association with so many activities, outreach, scientific and uh, astronomy outreach uh, um, uh, activities like the planetarium workshops, uh, festivals, uh, competitions with uh, working with youth and children. Uh, also, this is uh, um, a part of an interview uh, that was made with Beatrice uh, for uh, the um, uh, for um, a scientific uh, magazine that we work on in our association uh, with the collaboration of other collaborators and so many other lecturers and uh, and working on education, especially, especially scientific education. Uh, so this is the um, serious FASCO team. Uh, here you find that uh, there are a lot of uh, students from different uh, backgrounds, a lot of members with different spe uh, specialties that we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, talk about uh, in just a few seconds. So, in general, I want just to mention some statistics. At the very start, uh, for uh, the organization of the team, there were uh, eleven female and twelve uh, male uh, members, uh, which is uh, a little bit equal. And they were working uh, working alternatively, but then uh, they they work from uh, different. They come from different fields: uh, physics, astrophysics, sometimes even medicine, like me, uh, electrical engineering, um, science in general, economy, um, um, architecture, etc. In addition to uh, some few uh, middle school and high school uh, students. That was at the beginning. And until now, we could uh, reach the number of more than 4,000 image treated, 88.8% uh, uh, with uh, object, with the object is still there, uh, options selected, and uh, around 11.2% possible candidates. And it's like once uh, in a blue moon. Uh, and um, uh, now we are looking to uh, some collaborations uh, with some African and Arab associations like Sahel Astronomy Association, Zarqala, uh, some Lebanese uh, association, uh, associations like the Lebanese Association for Astronomy. So we basically were basically focusing now to involve more uh, Algerian uh, association, uh, associations and clubs, scientific clubs, in addition to African and Middle Eastern uh, ones. Uh, so here, I would like to share something uh, I find really important, which is um, I, I will present a brief overview on the work uh, chain and the organization of the team. How do we work as citizen science project? So here you see some photos from a recent workshop that we held uh, last month with the kids from high and middle school in Serious Astronomy Association. So in general, I want to share this uh, little experience. Uh, the members uh, attend a training uh, workshop uh, of uh, sometimes from uh, two hours or even more uh, to know more about the VASCO project. And then they will uh, they they should be divided into groups. Every group, uh, 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 every group uh, um, is um, meant to treat some uh, or a couple of, of images that was at the beginning, uh, so that uh, uh, every single pair like they could uh, they can um, um, check the work and uh, review it uh, twice. And uh, this division enabled uh, that double checking, and then. Uh, uh, the image sets were then dis distributed and of course um, uh, at the beginning we couldn't give a lot of uh, images to the participants so that they can um, um, they can tackle and master uh, the work especially that it works for artificial intelligence so we have the great responsibility to uh, uh, to work as accurately as possible and then um, uh, with the time like um, uh, with practice uh, as well, so a good uh, a good uh, number of members they could uh, treat more than uh, 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 10, 20, 30, 40, and even 100 uh, images. And uh, our members now at least they match t uh, 100 uh, images per campaign. And the best record ever was recorded by Iman Hasha, uh, uh, 24 years old, uh, who could uh, treat 900 image uh, per campaign. Uh, in the last campaign. Uh, now, 
uh, members uh, are then after uh, uh, after being introduced uh, to the project and well trained, uh, they are given sufficient time to turn in uh, their work uh, in uh, form of a, a TXT file. And then we, uh, so this is something like we, it's a standard so that we can review uh, accurately the work. And uh, members always are encouraged to put comments as uh, Dr. Beatriz previously mentioned. So we, uh, we encourage our members to uh, put comments under each process image when needed did also to check uh, the inspect bottom to see the different uh, other USNO uh, images and uh, PenStars uh, telescope images. And the review when at last is made by a couple of members like me and other, uh, 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 other uh, uh, members as well. Uh, the, Im the final images are then classified uh, in some documents and we, tr uh, we try to, uh, to, uh, to uh, um, to present the candidates, the possible candidates, uh, and then send it to the team of ASCO, Dr. Beatrice in particular. Uh, at last, these are some activities. So we uh, workshops, uh, we uh, held some workshops, courses. This is our participation in the last uh, international workshop uh, that took place in April uh, 2021 uh, with the VASCO team from all over the world. Uh, this is a real attendance workshop that we uh, held with the kids with more with around like 35 to uh, 40 participants, including uh, middle and high school students. Uh, also, we work, we try always to encourage um, the hard working members. Uh, we, we offer them some uh, gifts, awards, uh, honor certificates uh, signed by the association uh, and encourage their workers so they work more because we know that the most important thing is in this project that is based on, uh, on artificial intelligence as well is to, um, to treat as, uh, as big data as possible. And we also held uh, so many virtual workshops and meetings uh, through uh, Zoom. Now to uh, uh, to finish up with uh, my little uh, my, my short presentation, I want to mention some of our goals in Vasco for 2021 uh, 20, uh, and 2022. Actually, we started working on that, uh, and our first goal is to reach a good number of uh, matched images, ten thousand uh, ten uh, um, uh, thousands or more. Uh, by September 2021, but we guess that we can reach even more after uh, working on the project these last months. Also, uh, we want to involve more Algerian and Middle Eastern associations in that uh, promising project. Uh, we are looking forward to hold a national workshop for VASCO uh, with the Dr. Beatriz and the team, uh, all the uh, uh, mesmerizing team of VASCO in Algeria. Uh, of course, um, uh, within the facilities given after the uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic, and also uh, this is a good part that we, the good part of our a good uh, side project that we want to uh, include in Vasco, which is working with the children, with the kids uh, uh, through uh, workshops. We already started this, uh, from which uh, this uh, image, were, uh, the previous image, were, were, was taken, and of course collaborating with uh, with um, primary and middle school uh, clubs of uh, astronomy and science uh, through uh, in, uh, in Constantine, in Algeria, and even in the Arab world. Also, we have some other goals and side projects for Vasco, and we want to keep them um, uh, uh, as a surprise. And yeah, um, we promise uh, that we reveal them by soon, by 2022, uh, and uh, uh, we'll cross uh, the bridge and we'll come to it, inshallah. Uh, that was everything I have for this presentation. I tried to be, uh, to, to present as quick as I could, and uh, welcome to, uh, to, uh, to your questions. Thanks again for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Okay, thank you, Kaula. Thank you. Very interesting to see all the work that's going on there from Sirius. Um, now, I, I believe uh, Emeka is here, um, but Emeka, I wondered if you want, if you just want, if there's something you wanted to add, maybe just for a couple of minutes, that time is getting on. I also want to bring in our um, other speaker, Miracle from Nigeria, um, to talk about uh, the asteroid search. But Emeka, are you here? I did see you earlier. I don't know if there's something specific you want to add from your point of view. 
Is Emeka here? Oh, yes, he's okay. here. He's here. Okay. Emeka, is there something you wanted to add? Otherwise, we can come back to you. I think I think we should go to miracle if that's okay. I'm not I'm not sure uh, why Emeka can't come on. Um, so uh, miracle, are you there? Oh, you're not having a lot of luck. <laughs> see online let me have a look through oh they're both there okay and a miracle was just now uh on a sent me a message so so a miracle is uh um, a physical sciences teacher um from nigeria and he's also one of the uh, the nyx uh, from the office of astronomy education for nigeria uh, and I know that he himself was involved in the asteroid search campaign and, and after he was involved, then he's actually uh, been trying to get uh, more teams from other countries uh, also involved and he kind of mentors the teams to help them through. Um, oh. uh, Sarah, I okay, just yes. was saying he's there. Do you want to... Okay. <laughs> want to finish that? <laughs> okay. Okay, so yeah, sorry. So, okay, so, I have... Uh, yeah, sorry. So, yeah. So, okay, Emeka, if you just want yeah, to add I a little bit about some, the Vasco. Uh, network issues. Okay, and then we'll, we'll go to Miracle. Okay, I would quickly um, talk about our... Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? I could, yes, we can hear okay, you now. It kind of I went off quickly, and on a bit. Uh, talk about our experience before my network. Okay, so... Let me just um, let me just uh, share this. My PowerPoint refused to open. So this um, what we've been able to do uh, in at uh, the, in Nigeria here. Now uh, so far within our group uh, is made up of people from Nigeria and Cameroon. And uh, to be frank with you, most of the people within our group have not met them before. So. You may not get an image of a people sitting together. We've not met for the first time. A good number of them, I don't know them, and they don't know me. So we just meet virtually. Now, um, so far, we've been able to have two phases of a um, VASCO program. The first one we had in early, two, uh, early I think, uh, 2020, we had the first group of people that participated in the VASCO project and um, each and every one of them was able to work on about 3,000 images, the first set of people, no, about 200 images, sure, yeah. Now, this year we had a second group of uh, people who joined us in VASCO. Now, we kind of did an analysis. 12 of them were space scientists, 10 non-scientists, eight undergraduates, five graduates. so in total, we had about 35 people who participated in the last VASCO citizen science. And then we had about 65,950 images. We worked on 65,920 images. Of these images, we observed that some objects disappeared, some had defects, some irregular shapes objects we are seen and uh, some dark matter, though these things are all assumptions, the appearance of a uh, dark matter, the irregular shaped object. So a lot of, I hope you can still hear me. Okay, so now at the end yes. of the day, we, we inspected a total of uh, 3,428 images <laughs> of which 1,454 have defects. And uh, we observed about 88 uh, objects vanished and then 21 objects appeared. So we further went on to itemize some of the, uh, the case numbers, the image numbers so that we can further look at them, anyone who is interested. So we itemized some of the images that um, 
each central object disappeared like uh, 148265 and a good number of them. Um, so these are so far so good what we've been able to do. We are now looking forward to a third phase where we can get more people involved. In fact, ab initial, we wanted to, our target was to look at about 120 images. But at the end of the day, it wasn't possible, but we were able to reach a benchmark of uh, more than 65,000. I know we've, we, we had more uh, 65,950 images we worked on. And uh, also, like Beatrice, uh, maybe I don't know whether she mentioned it, there's a master student who is also looking at some of those candidate images. So the, the student is working on it as her thesis. So we are really making progress in that direction. Sorry, I didn't prepare a very good PowerPoint. Thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you, Emeka. Thank you very much. Okay, let me stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks. So, if you, can, uh, if you can help me to stop sharing my screen, I think is kind think, of. A, I think you're the only person that can. <laughs> there should be a button somewhere. Okay, okay, okay. I got it now. <laughs> I've stopped sharing. Thank you, thank you. All right. Great. Okay, so quickly, quickly. Uh, Miracle, are you with us? I did see you earlier. Miracle, can you hear me? I can see that you're there. I'm getting a message that your bandwidth is low. Can you hear us? Okay, can I go on? Oh, yes, please. Hear? Yes, yes, I can hear yes, you now. Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Great. Please go ahead, Miracle. I can hear you. Okay, please go ahead. But I'd already introduced you, yes, so please I can go hear you very Please go okay. ahead, Miracle. Oh, thank you so much for... All right, hello, thank you so much for granting me this opportunity. All right, so my name is Murad. Okay, okay, okay. Um, we first participated in the ZEC program in 2018, and uh, me and my boss, the CEO of Astronomer Borders Nigeria, we made several observations of the number of them that are right. So, our program, I know that many African countries, South and African countries were represented. So I and I have friends across the continent that are very interested in space science and astronomy. So I did it like this going favor them because they like space activities. So from then I did some of them in 2021. Uh, on May we created uh, Nigeria participated with several people and we made several asteroids. And also on August, we, we I engaged uh, Nigeria and Benin. And also on August, I engaged Nigeria and Mozambique. And this month, we are having King Yato and Cameroon participating in the program. And by 20, We have lost, uh, have lost is, him. Has he gone off? Oh, his, his, his connection wasn't good. Um, I mean, basically, he was just saying that he himself took part in the uh, asteroid search and then uh, uh, was obviously sort of very excited by the whole project. And since then, he's, he's sort of used his network to bring in teams from other African countries. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so that's what he's, he's continued to do. Um, I think since time is getting on, if, if he can rejoin us then fine, but otherwise um, we've heard some wonderful talks um, uh, we've, from Dr. Patrick and uh, Dr. Beatrice. And then also we found out a bit about what is happening already in Africa. So now we'd like to turn it over to, to you, to the people who've been listening. Thank you so much for coming along and listening. Uh, so if you have questions for any of the speakers, uh, and if you're wondering, all right, what can you do next? What is the way forward? Uh, please feel free uh, to speak. So maybe if you could raise your hand. 
that might be a good way so we can get people in order. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to raise your hand. Just yeah, in the so meantime, I would like to say, um, Sarah is one of us, uh, Mehdi, who is also the ISAC uh, coordinator for Algeria or for the for uh, Sirius. And he, unfortunately, he's with us, but not with us because he's driving, <laughs> so he cannot intervene. But he wishes to be part and say a few words what we have been doing with ISAC anyway. Uh, so, but anyway, so that's maybe he might say something in the discussion later on when we he will be in a safe way of. You'll be safely, you can speak safely. So I see Niroj raising his yeah. hand. So, okay, go ahead, then, Niroj. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering uh, can people who have uh, never, you know, never engaged with the citizens project raise their hand so we know how many people are, are, are newcomers to this idea? So, yes, if you so never we've... been a part of it, part of a citizens project, not just these two, but anything else, uh, can you raise your hand so we'll know? Yeah, so, saying if you've never been involved in a citizen science project please raise your hand don't be shy we're just interested to know it looks like only a couple of people I think just a couple of people. Maybe there. some people, yeah. Maybe some people do not know how to raise their hands, so you might get the wrong impression that everybody is a, is a citizen science here. You might ask <laughs> the other question and find the same kind of the same number of answers. So don't sorry, uh, yeah. So don't believe you, what, yeah, Jamal, that's a good. Yeah. Sorry, Jamal, that's a good point. So if you all go to the bottom right of your screen, there's a button called reactions. If you click on the reactions, there is a bar at the bottom called raise hand. But if not, then we can go ahead. I mean, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we can just go ahead, Sarah. So okay. majority of people seem to have been involved in some project or the other. Okay. That's great. But is there any questions to any of our speakers? I mean, one thing that I uh, sort of wanted to get clarification on was just what uh, what people need if they want to take part uh, what do you need is it just um, an internet connection um, I mean do you need like the internet connection all the time or it's just at certain times maybe to download information can you do things from a phone or does it have to be a laptop uh, that, that, that kind of thing might be useful so at least people know what it is they what, what are the requirements if they want to take part So I don't, know, I don't know if either Patrick or Beatrice could answer that. Well, in the case of uh, Isaac, uh, you need to have a PC. The software we have is uh, does not work on a Mac. It's PC-based. Uh, we are developing, uh, uh, through our new uh, NASA funding, the capability to, to use other, other platforms besides, besides a computer. But currently, you need the internet connection to download the data. You don't need it full-time. You just download the data. And then you analyze the data separately on your PC. And then you submit your report uh, online through our website uh, uh, to, to Isaac. It's a report containing the positions of, of the uh, uh, time positioning of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, detections of the asteroids. You, you're oh, sorry. Muted. Thank you, but yes, <laughs> thank you. <Sorry. laughs> uh, uh, maybe the same question for you, Beatrice. What do people need if they want to take part in Vasco? One only needs a web browser. Any computer works, and one will need the internet because it's um, the Citizen Science webpage is uh, on a particular webpage called ML Blink. I will send it here. Okay. In principle, yes. one could be one should be able to do this from a tablet or so. However, I think it's much more comfortable to do it. Uh, sorry, I sent it to, uh, I need to send it to everyone. I try once more. Um, and from a phone, it might be too small. One will not be able to see um, these images with good resolution. So a computer or a tablet. 
Great, thank you. So any questions from any of our uh, participants? Ella, oh. Ella, can I yeah, ask Rogers. a question? Yes, yeah, sure, yes. Rogers. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I've been excited by your, the information from the speakers. It's quite an interesting program. Uh, it's my first time to join this forum. I was referred to by Michael who was having difficulty in communicating because of network. But I come from Uganda and we work with teachers program, science-based program under the National Curriculum Development Center with the the science and mathematics teachers, that's my role as a trainer. But the, of late, uh, uh, we have had a new introduction of uh, astrophysics and uh, astronomy in our curriculum. It's something, something new. We are trying to struggle how to help children learn and how to help our teachers teach. And I find this would be very, very interesting for us to get into practical activities and it is really an opportunity for us. Uh, actually, the question I wanted to ask is how do you start? Uh, Beatrice has really said maybe you need a computer, you need a browser and maybe a smartphone. But I wish if there could be a simple demonstration how to get into that so that we can be able to follow and uh, move on the, from there and perhaps what are the indicators because i feel maybe an asteroid has been discovered by somewhere H how do you really find that this is something new in the, in the search or somebody has already pointed it out and uh, i would like maybe to have some basic indications that something you are discovering is quite new thank you well regarding uh regarding astro discoveries uh we we carefully monitor uh the uh, the measurements that you send back to us during a campaign during the 30 days of the campaign and we check those uh, those measurements with respect to uh, what's been reported currently by the sky surveys, and what is currently also in the uh, in the in Minor Planet Center database. And so we know uh, by the end of a week, and we we publish this on site, and you can go on site and see all of the uh, uh, asteroids that were detected by students that are uh, uh, that are original detections. That uh, have never been have never been reported before. At the end of a campaign, we go through and we filter uh, we filter the observations for all the reports uh, that are submitted by by PanStars, and uh, we produce what we call the faint list. The faint lists are actually asteroids detected by the students that uh, were not re were not reported by the sky surveys. They're original detections. Uh, since uh, we began doing this uh, as of January 2019, uh, we've made almost 8,000 of, of these kinds of detections, of which 50 have been uh, uh, near-Earth object candidates. So we do this, this, uh, this analysis behind the scenes as your students and teachers work uh, 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 with the images and report back to us their, their findings. And then we, then we tell them, within the week and then later at the end of the month, uh, what the status is of their observations. Now, as far as starting, uh, all they have to do is go to our website uh, on a browser and uh, there's a, a registration line. You just click register. Uh, you type in the information that we request there, basically your name and, and, uh, and uh, 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 email address. And we coordinate with you to participate in the uh, uh, in future campaigns. Thank you very much, Patrick. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add about the uh, asteroid search campaigns. If you go onto the website, they they have the list of all the campaigns, and some of them are 
internationals. I mean, anybody can join from anywhere. And then some of them are for specific uh, countries like the All India. And uh, uh, I believe, I hope I'm allowed to say that, that, that there will be an All Africa campaign uh, in sort of January, February next year. Yes, uh, so that would right. be great to kind of, uh, you, know, you know, really encourage that and get as many people as possible from Africa to join. Having Absolutely. said that, you know, if you if you can't, if the dates aren't convenient, you know, you can still join any other campaign at any other time in the year, but there is going to be the first All Africa one. Uh, yeah, we we have 11, 11 campaigns a year. The only only month we don't do campaigns is December. And that's that's to give the staff, uh, my staff, uh, some, some downtime. Yes, I'm sure they deserve that. <laughs> uh, now, I think I saw another hand up. Uh, I think I saw Josiah. Did you have your hand up? I seem to have lost you now. Oh, your hand is down. But did you have a question, Josiah? Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Sorry, I joined a bit late. So my question might have been answered earlier. So my question is to um, um, Beatrice about how to register for the VASCO and if one can register in this some group of people that I want to um, do the project together. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, we just send me an email and we can start uh, like working together on this. That's my suggestion. So Good, thank you. I no, no, so I was going to say, sorry, sorry, Bridget. So uh, if you say he should send him, you an email, do you, is it okay to put your email in the Absolutely. chat? Oh, Absolutely, okay. I can write. I can write it in the chat. Um, so uh, I will be happy to also, if people want to uh, get to know our um, interface, I can always. Uh, I will be happy to do a demonstration of the citizen science webpage for the new for the new groups. So that could be. Uh, there is also a tutorial, but it might be also good if I show it live. Great. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, and I can see uh, Mekti with your hand up. Uh, Mekti, are you the person for, that's involved with ISAC in Algeria? Yes, uh, I'm uh, the member. Okay, great. I hope, well, you, uh, I hope you're not driving at the moment. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, because uh, some people, lots of people have uh, uh, some problem with uh, the installation of uh, the program. Uh, uh, Lexi, your, your audio is very low. We can't hear you very well. Is it possible to either speak louder or be closer to your mic? Yes. Uh, do you hear me now? That's a bit better, yes. yes uh, uh, I talked talk about uh, uh, some people, have, uh, lots of people, uh, listen, uh, but they have a uh, problem with the, the installation of the uh, uh, astronomical program. Uh, I don't know if we can uh, run it uh, on a uh, browser. Sorry, are you, I think you're saying that because some people have a problem with the uh, installation of Astrometrica, are you saying it, it, you're asking if it would be possible to just run it from a browser? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. I think that, I guess that's a question for Patrick. Right. Well, we currently don't have that capability. Um, the, uh, the program operates uh, uh, on a PC Windows-based platform. You can run it on uh, uh, Mac platforms, Apple platforms, but you have to have a, uh, a, dual, uh, a dual operating system. Now, what we have done with the, uh, uh, we have an install utility. Uh, if you'll download our version of Astrometrica, which you find on our website, you download, it automatically installs it for you it points to, to the correct folders automatically and gives you the required configuration files. It's just a, a two-step process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mr. Oh, go ahead. There's a follow-up question for Patrick on the chat, asking whether the software will work on Ubuntu or any Linux, or is it only Windows-based? It's only Windows-based. Okay. Uh, it might work, uh, I think, yeah, it, the one that we use is Windows-based. I was just going to say I was I was surprised. I mean, I I did take part in an asteroid search recently, and, and I thought the uh, 
yeah, the Astrometrica seemed to all install very easily. I, I think with, with our team, more, more, it was the thing that caused more problem was just people being able to um, uh, unzip things like download from an email. If I was sending something out by email is that that actually seemed to be more of a technical problem is, oh, how do I download this attachment and how do I unzip things? But the actual software uh, was- It's was just okay, two but... clicks and it's, it's two clicks and it's done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That was a big problem in the early days until, until, we, until we did the installer. I mentioned Sorry. something, uh, oh, Sarah. Yeah, sure, go ahead, Jamal. Yeah, uh, in that respect, I mean, Mehdi has done a good job in preparing uh, tutorials, at least in Arabic. But I imagine that tutorials, which, uh, because there is some learning curve in learning Astrometrica. Once you learn it, it's quite easy, uh, yes. actually. But uh, the, the learning curve for some, I mean, starters are quite big, big. So I imagine if we could uh, get this, uh, kind of uh, tutorial, I mean, video tutorial, uh, step by step. I don't know if uh, Patrick has thought of that in English, but at least we have it in Arabic and it can be done in other language, or we can even ourselves to put it up in other language like French or English if needed be. But I'm sure possibly Patrick has other solutions. It's great. It has to be one by one. I mean, going through all the steps uh, one by one, and you will, uh, and also, of course, we could also, in, as, as, in, as an African context, uh, have uh, help each other helping uh, groups started in various in, the, in various places in get, getting in touch and and, and and tutoring some people. That's another uh, thing uh, altogether. But let me hear from Patrick if there is such a tutorial available, video tutorial. I mean, which well, we, we've got we got we have the written manuals uh, that explain how to install and use Astrometrica and what to look for, and then we've also prepared a, a video version. Now these are currently in English. Although we have a YouTube channel and you can, you can uh, uh, switch to a different language for closed captioning uh, that, uh, uh, that describe these same manuals step by step, but, but using videos. So yes, we, we do have that. And we also have uh, 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 a team of, uh, of teachers around the world. I showed you some of them, some of the trainers, and their job is to, uh, to sit down and uh, and work with you if necessary one by one to help uh, to help help you understand how to participate. And we we probably get oh a few a few hundred uh, questions during each campaign that we distribute out to these teachers. And sometimes the teachers will use Zoom, sometimes they'll use email, but uh, in short order they're able to help the uh, the brand new people uh, get started with Astrometric. And like you say. That's the barrier. Once you get past uh, uh, that, that understanding how it works, uh, it's actually very easy. But it does take it does take a time or two. We we tell people spend an hour or two looking through these these training materials and uh, ask us those questions, and we can help you get started. That it does take that time. Can I just ask uh, Patrick? So you said the YouTube channel is that of? I mean, what does it come under? YouTube channel of? Uh, I'll have ISAT to ask. Or? Okay. Yeah, I'll have to ask. I have to ask my staff. Uh, okay. that, that they handle that. I just know that there is one and that we're, we're putting a couple of different uh, parts to it. One for the work we're doing with LCO and the Internet Telescopes and the other for the training program that we're setting up for uh, for future trainers in Isaac. But we do already have and have been using for years the written manuals yeah. and uh, we have complimentary videos that go with those written manuals. Okay, that's great. Maybe we, we, maybe after this we can we can check that uh, that link and we can send it out to the participants. Uh, Niruj, you have your hand up. Uh, Josiah had his hand up, but then he oh, put sorry, something sorry. in the chat, so you might want to take a look at that and read it out. Ah, okay. So Josiah has said there is a way to run the Astrometrica software on Linux-based operating systems like Ubuntu using the Wine Viewer. Uh, it makes one run Windows software on Linux. Oh, okay, and he said he's he's used that in the October campaign. Yeah, there's been some so people that's... who've used it uh, on Macs as well, uh, using a, a, a dual operating system. But they've done that. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so Niruj, is that why your hand was up, or do no, you no, I just want to say something. Uh, so okay. it looks like I mean, so I think the great thing is, like you pointed out, there are many many groups across Africa doing. You know, citizen science, both with as the IASC and the uh, Vasco for many years now. 
and there are also groups who want to start right so i thought one thing one useful way to get a go about it is if i can request all the all the various people here who are already involved in citizen science uh, to kind of send me an email with some details saying you know which is a group you are involved in uh, you know which country or in some email name etc i'll compile them all and i can send them to everybody so everybody knows the list of contacts in africa uh, for each of the two uh, projects and i also add information i get from patrick and beatrice about you know email addresses and urls and so on so i'll put my email on the chat uh, so if you are involved in citizen science and i think most of you are just drop in email and tell me tell me what you are involved in and i'll compile them all can't unmute yourself yes <laughs> that would be great thanks nirud any other questions Chris? okay yes there's nirud's email in the chat any any other questions from anybody nirud do you want to lower your hand Great. let me ask a okay. question uh, as a quick one to to patrick just for the sake of waiting for other people to maybe have be inspired patrick uh, until which uh, magnitude have you reached in the asteroids that you provide to the uh, amateurs i mean which magnitude and how when are you going to be <laughs> finishing up the if whatever the, the magnitude you are at, if it's 19 or 20, are going to go to the next uh, things? I mean, uh, you... Well, with uh, the uh, Pan-Stars images, it runs about 22nd magnitude. 20 seconds? Yeah, 22nd magnitude. In fact, we're finding, we're about ready to, to release or uh, publish a paper where we're showing where the citizen scientists are actually discovering fainter asteroids than what are being detected on average by, by Pan-Stars. Uh, we're, we're finding we're finding in the fainter asteroids uh, they're missing the fainter ones and, and the citizen scientists are finding the fainter ones but we're at 22nd magnitude and I'm not sure the 19th magnitude ones have been pretty much discovered 20th they're getting close but you know 21st magnitude talk about quarter kilometer size objects lots of them out there to be found you say 40 kilometers the wide I don't know a quarter a quarter of a kilometer. And yeah, when you started in 19, uh, in 2006, well, how, what was the magnitude? That 19th, you were 19th magnitude. 19th. 19th, right. 19th to 20. In, in this business, those are the bright ones anymore. And at that time, also 19th magnitude was easily attainable by, by amateurs. And there were a lot of uh, amateur astronomers who were searching for and successfully detecting and discovering asteroids. And that essentially has gone away because of the large sky surveys, unless you've got an access to a telescope like PanStars, data from PanStars, uh, at least uh, uh, one and a half, couple meters across, uh, it's difficult anymore to uh, uh, to make to make original discoveries. But through Isaac, we provide we provide that data, and we hope, and we're talking to the folks at LSST. I uh, hope that, uh, and they'll go even fainter, hope that at some point we'll be able to provide data from LSST exactly the same way that we're doing with, uh, with PanStars. Now, uh, uh, I mean, a stupid, silly uh, question, uh, Patrick, still one more. Uh, I mean, do you think that's uh, one of those uh, big surveys, automated surveys with the IE and so on will beat up and, uh, and make uh, no place, we leave no place to the to this kind of uh, citizen science things when they do everything, on, uh, I mean, automatically with the, with the, the great uh, power that they have. I mean, how we're going to be saturated and, and, and lose, lose the, the battle, I mean. Well, perhaps, uh, I, I do know this, that uh, no matter what, what system you put into place, uh, there are going to be uh, objects that are not detected. For example, pan stars. Uh, there's a reason uh, why we find the faint ones and uh, and they don't report them. It's how they set up their their automated detection system, and there are a variety of reasons why. Uh, same thing is true with uh, with the Catalina data. All I'll tell you, we've had a hard time with the Catalina data. 
uh, of finding objects that uh, weren't det or detected by, uh, by that survey. But we know that they have a, uh, a threshold be uh, below which uh, they don't search through, the, uh, through those detections or those reported detections. And we know there's asteroid discoveries within those, within those along with a lot of false, false detections. So that's hard to say, uh, you know, um, LSST when it comes online and begins doing science uh, will certainly pick up a lot of faint ones, but pretty big sky. And when you get down to 23rd magnitude, 24th magnitude, uh, you're talking about lots and lots of asteroids for them to find. And miss. We find the ones that they miss. What about using a, a follow-up question uh, quickly, waiting for other people to, re to, re to, re to react also and ask questions. What about using later on things beyond PenStar, which can go, you, you make you go up to 33, to the third magnitude so that you could uh, possibly have a bigger a basis to of uh, of a story to offer to the people who are into Isaac. I mean, does he? Well, one thing we're looking at uh, uh, NASA has a, a line item in its budget for this coming year to uh, to fund a, a space space platform to look in the blind spots uh, that are, are that are missed by the ground uh, surveys, and we're talking to some people at Goddard about the possibility of Isaac being tied into that. If that happens then uh, we're looking at providing space-based data through the Isaac uh, uh, cloud-based platform and, and making that available out to the, uh, uh, the citizen scientists. So we're looking at that. And you're right, that would go down to uh, the, the, the limit detections of those space-based platforms. So I'm just reminding anybody, if you have any comments or questions, you can put them in the chat. We will be finishing up soon. Um, so don't wait if you have any other uh, questions or comments, as yes, we need to, we need to be uh, closing shortly. Um, so just while people are thinking, I'd just like to, to, to thank everybody for coming along, to thank our speakers, of course, uh, Patrick and Beatrice, uh, and also Kaula and Emeka and, and Miracle, who all spoke. Um, I, don't, I may, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, Niruj, can I hand over to you to kind of uh, round things up? Uh, no, why don't you just close it? <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming along. Uh, I said all our speakers and all of you uh, participants. Um, so, uh, I mean, I hope you have some ideas now of how you can take part. We've heard, we know the uh, links for the websites. Um, as I said, we'll find out about the um, uh, the YouTube channel that Patrick was mentioning. And also uh, uh, Miracle, unfortunately, he had a difficult connection, but he also put his email in the uh, chat and said he also does some uh, like coordinating and mentoring of, of teams and he can also help out with, with uh, Kind of training and introducing people to the to the topic um and then i believe also you can contract beatrice and i think emeka also said he's happy to help with uh training on the vasco so that we do have some some ways forward so uh with that i think i would just like to say thank you to everybody for coming along and we're looking forward to uh more on citizen science in Africa. So please uh, take the message forward, spread it to all your networks and your clubs and your groups. And if you have any question, you know, if you're not sure, do just come back to us. Uh, and it may well be that we organize some more events in future. Uh, and also, oh yes, I've just seen in the chat, yes, maybe Kaula could also help with training. I think we have a lot of really good resources, people who have good experience. So uh, thank you to everybody. I've just seen Mike there. Where, where were you? You didn't come in. Will you just come in, Mike? <laughs> anyway, no, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll close the meeting for today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, night, evening, and weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Bye -bye. Thank you for coming along. Thank you for coming. Good to see you again, Josiah.